there are many titles that the Bible gives to Jesus. And I want, in this two weeks leading up to Easter, I want us to focus on two of the titles of Jesus. The first one is Redeemer. We have this beautiful story in the Bible, the story of Ruth, where we see that it's a story of redemption. And the next week, I, I want to focus on the title, The Suffering Servant, as we get that from the book of Isaiah. But when we hear that word, Redeemer, Redeemer, something happens in our hearts and our minds. Jesus is our Redeemer. So let's read from Romans 3. I want to read verse 23 and verse 24, and then I want to page to Mark, uh, Mark chapter 10, verse 45. Romans 3. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, or through Jesus who is our Redeemer. And then in Mark chapter 10, verse 45, we read the following, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. You see, that is the work of a Redeemer. A Redeemer is someone that pays a ransom. And here we find that Jesus Christ gave His life as a ransom for many. That word Redeemer, when that cross our lips, we, when we read it, when we hear it, uh, we are filled with a, a loving remembrance of how Jesus forgave our sins on the cross. But brothers and sisters, it's, it's more than just forgiveness. We are also reminded of the mighty, mighty price that it cost Jesus. The mighty price, the costly price of forgiving your sin and forgiving my sin. It's a mighty price He paid. Now if we might be tempted to just take our salvation for granted, just think this is just the way it should be, and, and, and we almost take it casually. Could it be that we forgot about the fact that it cost Jesus a mighty price? That it cost Him His life? That He paid that price? That you and I, that His church were bought with His own blood? I'm going to put quite a few scriptures on the board and you can take note, take uh, your phone out, take a picture of those scriptures. I might refer to them, I might read some of them. But in Acts 20 verse 28, we read where Paul says his farewell to the Ephesian elders. He said to the, speaking to the elders, and he says, Will you take special care of God's church whom he bought with his own blood? And so, when you and I recall to our mind and understanding that Jesus bought us with his own blood, he bought the church with his own blood, that will help us not to, to take our salvation, whether individually or collectively, for granted. He paid it in full. In John 19, Jesus' final words on the cross, and then his final word on the cross in verse 30, he said, It is finished. Tetelestai. It is finished. It stands finished. And it will always be finished. He paid it in full. It is a done deal. In the New Testament, those English words that we have for redemption, whether it's make a payment or buy back or release or to set free, all those words, all those terminologies are used in connection with the person and the finished work of Jesus Christ. That word redemption is also borrowed from the marketplace and actually helps you and me to understand the forgiveness of our sins in terms of a business transaction. In its most basic description, redemption means buying back. Buying back something that's been lost. It is securing a release. You're securing a release by the paying of a ransom. How many of us don't so much like a, a ransom movie. I remember uh, one of my favorites in 1996, Mel Gibson had this movie called Ransom. Uh, okay, and his, his son was 
taken ransom, and he's a wealthy businessman, and then he pays the money. And whatever it is, we just love those kind of stories because somewhere they connect to our most inner desire and need that, that, that hey, I want to be, be ransomed. I, I want to be bought out. I want to be set free. Uh, we love the hero in the story. We love the person, the, the person or the redeemer that's actually paying the ransom story or paying the ransom price. Now, there are three parts to any act of redemption. Three parts to any act of redemption. Number one, there needs to be property that is lost. There needs to be prop- uh, property that is lost. There's a price to that property. <laughs> And then there needs to be someone who is able and willing to buy back. Someone who's able and willing, so you need a redeemer. Now, there are many examples in the Bible of this. You would find that that people themselves, uh, they would be be selling themselves as slaves. So for one or other reason, you got yourself in a lot of debt, and then you can sell yourself as a slave to someone but then later on, when you, when you gain financial standing, you can actually buy yourself out. Uh, or there could be, uh, it could be some animals that, that need to be redeemed. Or it could be most commonly land. Okay, so you got yourself in debt and you will then give away this land and someone will farm the land. They will eat from the produce of the land. But later on, you receive money back. You're in a better financial standing and you actually buy that back. So, but there are two primary ways. It's either you yourself, as I explained now, that can buy that property or land back, or secondly, a close relative. A close relative would come and actually redeem you, actually pay the price for that land to bring it back. And what is that close relative called? A kinsman redeemer. Kinsman means a close relative a blood relative, a redeemer, a kinsman redeemer. And now in the story of Ruth, we we find that Boaz, who married Ruth, uh, he was a kinsman redeemer. And that Boaz ultimately points us to Jesus Christ, the ultimate and final kinsman redeemer. The story of Ruth. The story of Ruth starts in a lot of pain and tragedy. I want to encourage you to go to the Old Testament and read the four chapters of the story of Ruth. It's a beautiful gospel story. But it begins in sadness, a a series of whole tragic circumstances where where this Jewish woman named Naomi, um, she and her daughter-in-law Ruth, they found themselves without husbands. Their husbands died. They they are now widows, they are without land, they are without protection, Uh, they've lived in the land and the country of Moab, and they are now walking back to Bethlehem to see if there's any way for them to find security and to survive. Now once arriving in Bethlehem, the pattern of welfare that God instituted in that time, and you can go and read in Leviticus about it, this, this law of kinsman redeemer God instituted, uh, and they found themselves in Bethlehem, and the, the rule of welfare was that widows and orphans and those who are very poor, they are allowed to walk in the grain fields of the rich, and they are allowed to pick up uh, whatever grain fell on the ground and hence uh, feed themselves. So the harvesters many times drop these, these grain, uh, it's left behind on the field, and they can pick it up. But now Naomi... She was afraid of what could happen to Ruth. Because she, Ruth said to her, I'm going to go into the field and I can, I'm going to see if I can find some grain for us so that we can make food. But Naomi was scared what would happen to Ruth. Why? Because the whole story of Ruth takes place in the context of the judges. And when you go to Judges, the book just before Ruth, and you read the last chapter, then you read the shocking phrase, and in that time, Everybody did what was right in his own eyes. So it was a time of lawlessness. Hence, Naomi was concerned for Ruth because for a woman walking in that field and picking up grain, one terrible thing might happen. She might get raped. or She might get killed. And so it's important that she ends up in the field of where she will really take care of. And in the providence of God, 
in the providence of God, it so happened that Ruth found herself in the land, the grain field of the most respected bachelor in Bethlehem named Boaz. You see, Boaz was a godly man in his speech. Boaz treated his, his people well. He looked after them. He took care of the women and made sure that they will not be sexually exploited in his field. He gave extra to them. And then he was specifically very generous with his resources towards Ruth. In, in Ruth 2, verse 9 to 16, we read that he gave extra food and water for Ruth. He, he had a special place for Ruth. And so when his harvesters would walk, he would say to them, when you see that Moabite woman called Ruth, you accidentally drop more of the grain so that she can pick up. And he would call her and say, whatever she needs, give it to her and do not chase her away. But the most important thing about Boaz is that he was related to Naomi. He was a close blood relative to Naomi. And therefore, that qualified him to be a kinsman redeemer. So I want to read to you Ruth chapter 2, verse, verse 20. And so Naomi is speaking now to, to Ruth and Ruth told her what happened. So she, Ruth, uh, told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked uh, and said, the man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, may he be blessed by the Lord whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi also said to her, the man is a close relative of ours, one of our redeemers. Or other translations would be said, he is our kinsman redeemer. And you see, the culture of that day was that redemption was always a family matter. Now keep that in mind, because that's very important when it comes to the biblical doctrine of redemption in the person and the finished work of Jesus. So I say specifically in the person of Jesus and what we confess in our faith about Jesus and what we believe about Him. Okay, and his work. So it's not just his work on the cross, but it's also the person of Christ, fully God and fully man. Redemption was always a family matter. So the right and the responsibility to, redeems, to redeem someone's property was always a close relative, a kinsman redeemer. And, and God's intention with that law was that the property would always remain in the family. It will be in the family. Um, and, and, and the person that's got the greatest interest, the person with the greatest personal interest, that person uh, whose, whose own flesh and blood is involved, they will be the redeemer. So if I have flesh and blood family, and he or she is now a slave, or he or she lost their piece of land because of debt, then I've got the greatest personal interest, and it's my responsibility now as a close family member to be a kinsman redeemer, buy back that piece of land so that my close family relative can go and farm the land again, so that the land and the property will always remain in the family. Now back to the story of Ruth, we found that, 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 that there, was, there was land. Naomi had land. They moved. There was famine in Bethlehem. They moved from Bethlehem to Moabite. There she got uh, Ruth as a daughter-in-law, Naomi, with her husband, and their two sons moved there. They were in Moab, but then they died, and then hence Naomi and Ruth going back to Bethlehem. So Naomi once had a piece of land in Bethlehem. So there was, in the story of Ruth, uh, there was land that was lost. There was land that needed to be redeemed. And now they just found out there's a kinsman redeemer. His name is Boaz. But here's the thing. We said three things in any act of redemption. There's property lost, there needs to be a kinsman redeemer, and there's a price to be paid. There's a price tag on that. There's a purchase price. And so when we go back to Ruth and we read uh, chapter 3, and if you read it in your own time, you will find something happening in Ruth 3. Uh, here we see that, uh, Naomi said to Ruth, okay, you actually need to go and propose marriage now to this guy. And how it worked in that time is that uh, you actually go to the harvested, 
uh, uh, field and when the, the harvester or, or when that owner of the land, in this case Boaz, he will go to sleep, uh, the woman will actually go to the feet of the man and just lie there and then the man will respond favorably or unfavorably. And so Ruth or Naomi said to Ruth, you're going to take a nice bath, you're going to put on your best clothes and you're going to put on your best perfume, Chanel number no. 5 or whatever the number was there, maybe it was number 1. Okay, and so here goes Ruth. Uh, but not, d- don't think now modern day movies, okay? D- don't think in terms of lust, okay? Don't think in terms of one night stands, okay? Think in terms of I'm giving myself. I'm, I'm willing to give myself to be linked to you, to be connected to you eternally, securely, safely. And so Ruth ends up at this threshing floor, uh, lies at Boaz's feet, and during the night he figured out there's someone, and he asked, who are you? He said, it's Ruth, and, said, and Ruth said to Boaz, but you are my kinsman redeemer. And then he, he does a beautiful gospel thing that points towards Jesus Christ. He then covers her with his cloak. She said, cover me with your wings. And we are covered in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He was a righteous, godly man. He was a righteous, godly woman. A a Moabite woman who have sworn allegiance to the God of of Naomi and of Israel. An upstanding woman. A virgin woman that's coming to this man. And he covers her with his cloak. Meaning that, that I will protect you. I will take you to be my covenant wife. Forever and ever. And then Boaz said, but there's one challenge. There is another kinsman redeemer in a higher pecking order. So there's this number one, whatever this guy's name was. And then I'm like number two. So we got a bit of a challenge. But as an upstanding business person in his day, Boaz called the elders of the day. He called this guy in and he said, I've got a business proposal for you. You are the first relative in line to actually buy back this piece of land that belongs to Naomi. Are you willing? He said, yes, for sure I'm willing. Because you, or, or rather able, you need to be able and willing. This guy says, I am able. I've got enough money to buy back this land. Yes, it's mine. I'll, I'll go for it. But then Boaz, in the wise negotiator that he is, he then said, okay, that's good. Uh, you are able but are you willing? Because there's just a bit of a twist. If you buy this land, you also get mother-in-law. <laughs> so are you willing to get mother-in-law Naomi to stay with you? And that was a bit of a tough one for him. I said, well, we could figure it out. How old is she? Okay, it's maybe just another year or so. I said, okay, we'll figure it out. And then Boaz said, okay, but you're also going to get Ruth now which is this upstanding, godly, beautiful young woman. But here's the other thing. You need to give her children. And then her children's going to inherit the land. So you're never going to have the land. And you see this other guy, he was just in it for the money. And then he said, no, I'm able, but I'm not willing. And then Boaz said, I am able and I am willing. Because Boaz then said, You know what? I am able. I've got the money to buy this land. But not only that, I'm willing to get mother-in-law, Naomi, to stay with us. I will protect her. I will care for her. Because their biggest problem was that they had social and economical and spiritual problems. But Boaz said, I will protect you. I will take you in. I will care for you. And Ruth, you will become my covenant wife. And Ruth, I will give you children. And Ruth, your children, they will inherit this land. Hence, this piece of land will always remain in the family. And so, now we find out that it was not just a business transaction. It was love. It was covenant love. He was able and he was willing. But now, Ruth's desperate situation reminds us of our own desperate spiritual neediness. You see, spiritually, we are in poverty. We need a Redeemer. 
We need a Redeemer that is able and that is willing to redeem us. We need a Redeemer that, that will not only engage in a business transaction, but that there will be eternal love as well. There would be covenant love. And so like everything else in the Bible, the book of Ruth connects to Jesus Christ. We have to understand the book of Ruth. Uh, we have to understand it in the person and the finished work and the ultimate redemption of Jesus Christ on the cross. When you read the genealogy at the end of Ruth, you, you find out that eventually Boaz now married Ruth, and then a son was born called Obed. And then Obed had a son, um, I, I want to say Isaiah. Um, no, well, yeah, uh, yeah in, in Afrikaans it's a, diff, a different name, and I want to translate that to, into Afrikaans into English, but it's Jesse, uh, Isai, okay, Jesse. And Jesse had a son called David. Connecting the dots? Boaz and, and Ruth's great-grandson was King David. And King David was a kinsman redeemer in his own right. He redeemed the nation of Israel. When he killed Goliath, it was not just a story of bravery. We, we want to make it a story of bravery and courage. Yes, it is bravery and courage and trust in God, but, but he's... Uh, his victory over Goliath was Israel's victory. And now Jesus is the greater and the better David. He killed the, the giant of sin and slavery and death and the devil so that you and I can be free. Jesus' victory on the cross became your and my victory. And so Jesus was just, or rather David was just all a, a kingsman redeemer pointing to the ultimate kingsman redeemer, Jesus Christ. Job called out in this, Job in chapter 19. Job said, I know that my redeemer lives. My redeemer will stand on this earth. Pointing to Jesus Christ. And then we read Matthew 1.16. And we have the genealogy of Jesus. And in there we find Ruth and Boaz and Obed and David. And we go right through and... Then from the Virgin Mary, Jesus is born. And so Boaz points us to Jesus, the greater and the better Boaz. So when you hear the story of Boaz, you see that's, that's not just a nice Old Testament story. It's a wonderful story of redemption pointing to you, for you and me to the ultimate story, the ultimate historical redemption account of Jesus being the greater and the better Boaz. And so we find ourselves, we have this picture, you and me, we are the property that is lost. We find ourselves behind bars. We find ourselves in jail of sin and the consequences of sin and the devil that's keeping us trapped. And there's a price for you and me to be paid. But beloved, it's more than money. It's blood. Because God reminds the Israelites in Leviticus, He said that, that life is in blood. And therefore, we had all the Old Testament sacrifices. He said blood needs to be paid. But, but now we need, a, we need a Redeemer, a Redeemer that is able and willing. And so the fact that the Redeemer always needs to be a kinsman underlines the important aspect of redemption we have in Jesus Christ. In order to accomplish redemption for you and me, it was necessary for God the Son to become a man. It's not just a statement of faith. You see, we need someone like us. We need our representative, someone that can represent us. We need a man of flesh and blood. We need someone that's part of the family of humanity. And therefore, when we hold on to our statement of faith and saying, but Christ Jesus, Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior, was born from the Virgin Mary, this is absolutely crucial to the fact of redemption. Because if He was not born, if Jesus was not born from the Virgin Mary, He would not have been the perfect representative. He would not have been the able representative of flesh and blood to take your and my place on that cross. And can you see now that, uh, that, that our faith is at attack when people say, how can a virgin become pregnant? It's, it's scientifically impossible for you and me, yes, but not for the one who created the womb. 
the one who created the womb, is the one that also said, my power will come over, will overshadow the virgin, and she will, she will become pregnant with God the Son. And so God got dressed in human flesh, so to speak. But you see, God cannot, there's one thing that God cannot do, and what is that? God cannot not be God. <laughs> he cannot lose his, his divinity. So he, Jesus, God the Son, remained completely, fully God. And yet at the same time, He became fully and completely man so that He can become our representative. Someone who's, who was perfect in obedience. Someone without sin. Because we needed a perfect sacrifice. Our redemption could never be accomplished by an angel. Our redemption can never be accomplished by an animal. Our redemption, our forgiveness of sin, being set free from guilt and shame and eternal death, the price, the redemption that needs to be paid had to be paid by a perfect sinless human being and blood because that is life. We needed a perfect human being. And so God the Son, the creator of the universe, stepped down into your and my mess and became one of us and lived a perfect sinless life so that He is the perfect sacrificial lamb who replaced all the other sacrifices in the Old Testament. Once and for all, never again do we need another sacrifice. Tetelestai. It's done. It's paid in full. It is finished. It's complete. It stands complete forever and forever. And so redemption... The biblical doctrine and understanding of redemption is not just the fact that your and my sins are forgiven. It, it, it goes way deeper than that. But, but redemption is one of the primary reasons why God the Son came in the flesh so that He can be our representatives. Born of the Virgin Mary. In Hebrews 2, we, we read Jesus said, he, he calls us His brothers and sisters. God coming in the flesh as part of the human race, to secure our freedom, secure our freedom from sin, the consequences of that guilt, shame, and those who were trapped in fear by the devil, those who were trapped in fear for death, He came to set us free, to take us out of that jail. Jesus is our kinsman redeemer, one who was like you and me in every way, tempted like us in every way, yet without sin. Therefore, He is able, because He was like you and me. But if the story ends there, it was a pure business transaction. But He was also willing, like Boaz. We read in John 10 verse 18, Jesus said, I have all the authority. What does that mean? It means there's no one above Him. <laughs> Uh, he, he doesn't need to get permission from anyone. It, it stops with him. He ultimately says, I've got all authority to do what? To lay down my life. We just read that in Mark 10, 45. And then Jesus said, if, if that was the end of the story, the, the, then, then we would not have had redemption. But then Jesus said, I also have all authority to take up my life. No one takes my life from me, Jesus said. I lay down my life for my sheep. And so what do we find there? Jesus is not just able, Jesus is willing. And this makes it a love affair. Your redemption and my redemption is not just the fact that my sins are forgiven, past, present, and future. It's the fact that you and I are married to Jesus. The church is the bride of Christ. Men and women, we get to be the bride. We get to be the spotless, beautiful bride of Jesus, the bridegroom, the best and ultimate Boaz, who's caring for us, who's looking after us, who's giving us an eternal inheritance, the one who, who bought us, not just for a business transaction, but because He loves us. He is our able and willing Savior. He bought us with His own blood. 1 Corinthians 6. 1 Corinthians 6, 
Verse 19, we read the following. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit with, within you, whom you have from God? You see, God no longer lives in buildings. That, that's why this is not the church. Can, can we please align our language and our terminology with the Bible? You are the church. The people, flesh and blood is the church. Today we see the church gathering all over the world. The bride of Christ is gathering in local congregations. Maybe we, 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 are, we, we might just be the tip of the pinky of His body. Another church might be the foot. Another church might be a different part. But we are the body of Christ. And so when we ridicule and say bad things about other churches, you're speaking against Jesus. By God's grace, He has called us as a local church beacon. He's placed us here to reach people that others won't reach. And other churches will reach others that we don't reach. But together we are the body of Christ. We, we need to hold on to the same absolute beliefs. And I've mentioned some of them. That Jesus became our representative. He was born of the Virgin Mary. He paid. He bought us with His blood. His blood flow. He bought us free. He set us free from Him. Uh, with His finished work, not my work. The church belongs to Christ. Listen. So, He lives in us. Mind-blowing. Supernatural. He lives in us. You are not your own. What do you mean I'm not my own? We raise our children to be independent. To go out of the house. To just be our own. To be our own boss. I can remember how that was something I longed for. Man, I just want to make my own decisions. Free state boy in the massive city of Pretoria. I can decide whatever I want to do. And there's something, something of the sinful nature, something of the disobedience from Adam and Eve lives in the crevices of my heart and it creeps out because I want to be disobedient. I want to be a rebel. I want to have it my way. I want to sing with Frank Sinatra. I did it my way. I want to get in the ship and I'm the captain of the ship. I'm the master of my own fate. You can do whatever you want. You just need to put your mind to it. These are all the things that the culture is telling us. But now, so, so what do you mean I'm not my own? So what do you mean, if, if, if for those of you who are married, it means then, then I belong to my covenant wife, and, and my wife belongs to a covenant husband. I'm not my own. And, and first, of all, first and foremost, but my wife is a daughter of the Most High God, so I better treat her. With a lot of care. Because she was bought with the blood of Christ. I've got only a very short while on this earth to take care of her. But, but I'm, I'm, I'm a representative. I reflect Jesus in marriage. And, and if you are not married, th that means you are still belong to Jesus. You are still bought with His blood. That means you, 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 you still belong to Him and you are, you are made available in His kingdom and you work and you are unmarried for the glory of God. You're not unmarried because you're selfish. You're not unmarried because women are difficult to work with. You're not unmarried because men are so stubborn. They can't pick up their clothes. That's not the reason why you're not marrying. You're marrying so that you can be available for God's glory for His kingdom. That's why you are unmarried. And you are married for the glory of God and for His kingdom. The, the one is not, not better than the other. You have both. <laughs> being married and being unmarried is for the glory of God. So those of you who are unmarried, don't say, I'm, not, I'm never going to get married. Because I'm just going to... It's so easier. I can spend all my money on myself. I can use all my time on myself. That's, that's selfish. That's not, that's not biblical. For those of us who are married, don't treat unmarried people as second-class citizens in God's kingdom. We are all the same. Marriage is just penultimate. Ultimately, we are married to Jesus. 
That, that, that's the marriage that's going to carry on forever and ever. You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, says 1 Corinthians 6.19. You were bought with a price, and that price is the blood of Christ. So glorify God in your body. In Ephesians, we read a similar thing. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. In Him, we have redemption through His blood. We have redemption. We've been set free. The ransom have been paid. We've been released. We have redemption in Him, in Jesus. We have redemption through His blood, through His life. By His blood. And you know what? Because He loves us. That's mind-blowing. I, I, I cannot completely, fully comprehend that. Why? Why would... Would the creator of the universe step into your and my mess and lay down his life, pay our guilt, pay for our consequences, pay for our sin? It's almost scandalous that he would pay for you and me. But He did, because He loves us. And we are betrothed to Him eternally. When Jesus Christ returns, there will be the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we will celebrate with Him. And we will be with Him forever and ever. And we will continue our relationships forever and ever, because that's what we take with us. Our Redeemer bought us with His own blood. We are made to belong to God. He created us to belong to Him, but we became slaves of sin. And sin brought suffering. It brought alienation from God. It brought us into spiritual bondage. Maybe you're sitting here this morning and you say, well, well I, need to get, I, I, need, I, I know I need to get to do something. I, I need to do something so that God will set me free and just forgive me. And you're trying by works to do, 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 do things. This morning, Jesus is saying to you, sit, stop. Jesus is saying to you, I did it all. He did the heavy lifting. He paid the price. He is able and He is willing. Come to Him and receive His mercy and His grace this morning. Be set free from the lie of the devil that you are not good enough. You are worthy. If you doubt your worthiness, I want you to meditate upon the bloodstained cross. Because when you see the empty cross and the empty grave, Jesus Christ this morning is saying to each and every one of you, you are worthy. You are worthy because He paid the price. He's able, and He wanted to do that. In Jesus, we have a Redeemer who provides exactly what you and I need. Forgiveness of sin, past, present, and future. Some of you stand in the forgiveness of Jesus. Some of you might be here this morning and you say, well, I need my sins to be forgiven. What should I do? You cannot do anything. But can I invite you after the service to come to the front? I would love to help you to understand what it means to be a Christian, what it means to put your faith and trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. This morning, Jesus is the one that can set you free out of the prison of guilt and shame. You do not need to bear the consequences and the punishment of your own sin because Jesus lovingly took that upon Himself. And if you have been set free in Jesus, may you marvel in that again. That's reason for falling on our face. That's reason for singing and jumping for joy. In Jesus, we have this Redeemer who provides forgiveness of sin, who releases from the consequences of guilt, feeling guilty, shame, Release us from eternal death. But He also gives us an eternal inheritance. The land, the earth, 
that was stolen, the earth that Adam and Eve worked, that was stolen, so to speak, Jesus bought back. Not just that land which belongs to him anyway and keeping it into the family. He's, he bought you and me so that when Jesus returned, there will be a new earth. There will be the garden of Eden on steroids. It will be a new earth. It will be rid of sin. There will no longer be the presence of sin. The glory and the light of Christ will be there and it will shine for us. We will be in His presence. We will be working and worshiping and living with Him, but also with one another. And our relationships will continue forever and ever and ever and ever to His glory and to our good. We have a wonderful inheritance. We will be married to Jesus, our greater and better Boaz, the true bridegroom, forever and ever. And we close our eyes. Lord Jesus, I pray that you will help us to grasp this deeper and deeper. Oh, Jesus, only you can fill our hearts and our minds with peace and with joy that comes from you. I pray that every person in this building will understand with their minds and experience in their hearts true forgiveness and redemption that is in Jesus Christ alone. And this was not just a business transaction, but this is a love affair. <laughs> thank you that you love us, Jesus. Thank you that you are willing. And thank you that you are able. We boast in your finished work upon the cross, Jesus. And we marvel in your love for us. We long for more of your love for us. Thank you that you are the lover of my soul. And thank you that you work in me to get me to love you. What a privilege. I pray that you will continue to fill us, Holy Spirit, with all the fullness of God. Thank you, Jesus. We bring you glory and honor. Amen.